Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Make Money Your Honey podcast. I'm so excited. I'm sure you can hear that I am super excited because I have I have the one and only, I have the legend, Gay Hendrix, on the podcast today. Yes, Gay Hendrix, that guy, the guy who wrote The Big Leap, the guy who coined the term upper limit problem, that Gay Hendrix. So for the three people who may not know who he is, Gay Hendrix has served for more than 40 years as one of the major contributors to the field of relationship transformation and body-mind therapies. He is a New York Times bestselling author and his books include Conscious Living and The Big Leap. And you know, we teased that Gay Hendrix was coming on the podcast on social media and you know, I let some people in my circle know that Gay Hendrix was coming and everybody like flipped out because everybody knows the big leap. Everybody's like, oh, I know what my upper limit problems are because of Gay Hendrix. He's coming on the podcast. That's so great. Oh my gosh. Everybody was freaking out. And um, I, I tell you, and I promise you that the podcast is just as good as you all thought it was going to be. So what did we talk about in this episode? Where do I even start? First of all, there's gonna be a couple things that you're going to notice. And if you're watching the video on YouTube, you're really gonna notice these two things. So number one, the amount of energy that Gay Hendrix has is amazing. The man is beaming, especially when he talks about his wife, Katie, who he's been married to for 40 years. It is. It is total couple goals. Like that is exactly what it is. But he's beaming and the level of energy he has and his happiness and his joy is infectious. The other thing you're going to notice is I was like hanging on every word. <laughs> I was so zoned in on every word that was coming out of his mouth because um, he's a legend and I wanted to pay my respects, right, to a man who revolutionized the personal development industry, a man who's revolutionized therapy, a man who's revolutionized business spaces, a man who's revolutionized relationship spaces. And I should say a man and, and, and also Katie has had a lot to do with that as well. So we talked about um, upper limits, right? So the way he explained it was that the big leap is kind of like learning how to identify those upper limits and how we self-sabotage and then starting to get into that zone of genius. And then his new book, which we're talking about, The Zone of Genius, it's all about how to stay in that zone of genius because we're we're creative beings, we're expansion, we're, we're consciousness. Like that is what how, how we're supposed to be living all the time, but we don't. And we don't for various reasons. He got into some of those reasons in the podcast interview. We also talked about um, actually some really interesting notions that he has in, in his new book, Zone of Genius, which I devoured in like one sitting, pretty much. Almost one sitting. <laughs> and... Um, he talks about the difference between ordinary creativity and true creativity, which is really fascinating. And we also got into a really cool conversation about commitment, recommitting, and unconscious commitment and how unconscious commitment can actually really keep us stuck as we are heading toward our goal. So that is definitely not something you're going to want to miss at all and he just he also has so many stories so many great stories to illustrate these points and then of course you know i share some of my own recent upper limit problems and you know I, like i said i was just hanging on every word so i'm i'm gonna stop talking now and we're gonna dive into this interview so you can just share in the wisdom that i did All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Make Money Your Honey podcast. I am joined by a legend in the personal development space, the one and only Gay Hendrix. And I teased the audience that you were coming. I let some people know that you were coming and they freaked out. Everybody was like, oh, I love the big leap. I know all about upper limit problems that those books changed my life. That guy's on my bookshelf. I tell everybody about this. So we are honored to have you here to talk about your work and also talk about your new book that, that you have coming out, which I had the pleasure of reading and it's, it's fantastic. So thank you so much for coming on the podcast and sharing your wisdom with us. 
Thank you so much. It's really my pleasure to be here. There's nothing I would rather talk about. It's one of my missions on this planet to get people up to speed on how they can take big leaps with love and grace in their lives. And so um, let's do it. Let's do it. All right. So for the, for like the three people who may not know who you are, <laughs> who, <laughs> who is Gay Hendricks and how did he get here? Well, I'm um, right now I'm sitting in Ojai, California, which is a little town about 60 miles north of LA in a little mountain valley. And uh, I love it. I've lived here. Katie and I, uh, we're coming up on our 40th wedding anniversary. And for half of that time, yes, thank you. Um, and uh, we'll be celebrating that in October. And if you're in the neighborhood, I want you to drop in. Um, but uh, we've been uh, in this house, we kind of found our dream house here 20 years ago, and we've been living here. And it's a long way from where I started. I actually grew up uh, in central Florida in the swamps and alligators part of Florida, not the beaches. I'm in Florida. What, what, part, what part of central Florida did you grow up in? I grew up in Leesburg, Florida. Okay, and I'm in Miami. Okay. Born and raised, well, uh, born and raised Floridian. <laughs> uh, well, you and I are both in the same uh, boat then. Uh, and Miami, when I was growing up in Leesburg, Florida, it's a little town about 40 miles from Orlando. And th that was pre-Disney. As a matter right. of fact, I remember my mom, my mother was the mayor of Leesburg for a while. So we were longtime prominent citizens of Leesburg. Since the turn of the last century, my grandparents were... were some of the founders of the town. And I grew up in a town where everybody knew everybody else. And so it's kind of a um, different sort of life than I've ended up in living out in California where <laughs> nobody comes from the same place. You know, everybody kind of right. meets here that's coming from someplace else. Um, but um, yeah, I grew up in a, a lovely old Southern family and a I had my grandparents right next door and an aunt and uncle down the street and another aunt and uncle down the other street. And I love so, that. Yeah, it's kind of like an old fashioned kind of growing up that I know my daughter certainly didn't have moving all over the place with me as I went around from place to place. But um, yeah, and then I had, oh, oh, I got to tell you about something extremely important. When I was growing up, I had a real medical problem. Something was wrong with me glandularly when I was born so that I put on weight faster than babies should. And so by the end of the first year of life, I was one of those really fat babies that you see pictures of. And it was kind of weird because in my family, everybody else was skinny. And so as I kept growing up, I became a fat two-year-old and a fat three-year-old and a fat kindergartner and a fat first grader. And while everybody else in my family is skinny. And so I was taken around to different specialists because they knew something was wrong. And it turned out I'd been born with a real severe glandular imbalance of, uh, uh, you know, pituitary and thyroid hormones weren't getting through to me. But I get, I had lots of different medical things, but nobody ever really cracked the code. I remember one year they put me on amphetamines when I was in the ninth grade and I made straight A's that year because I couldn't sleep and I was yeah. you know, sitting up till three o'clock in the morning studying and um, so then they took me off those and I went back to being a regular uh, B student. Um, uh, I'm getting to the point though which is that when I was 24 I had an enlightenment experience that changed everything. By then I weighed almost 300 pounds, almost maybe more than 300 pounds. There were times that I did weigh more than 300 pounds. I weigh about 180 now and have for the past lot of years. Uh, I'm six feet tall. So on me, 180 looks like athletic. Uh, but uh, in uh, 1968, uh, 1969, when this occurred, I was uh, anything but uh, fit. You know, I was hundred and some pounds overweight and I was in a terrible relationship that I was trying to get out of and I uh, was in a job I didn't like and I you know all systems were wrong in my life and I was ripe for a transformation and fortunately it happened and um, the details are in my books but but I'll give you the quickie version of it which is I had an accident where I fell down hard on my back and I kind of knocked the wind out of myself I didn't knock myself out um, unconscious, but I kind of whoomp and knocked myself into a different state of consciousness for about two minutes where I saw things that I'd never seen before. They were buried under all that fat, I guess, 
but I could feel all of these feelings I'd never tapped into before, things I was angry about, about my father's death and sad about, about various things in my family. And I could feel layers of joy and happiness that I never let myself feel. And way down at the bottom of everything though, at the center of everything, I could feel what I now call pure consciousness, which is this gift that we're given just by virtue of being here, it's our being. And it doesn't have anything to do with the programming that's added on top of that, what family you're born in or what experiences you have. But we all have this gift of this pure consciousness. And it's the place where we need to own in order to redesign our lives. And so in that moment, I realized, oh, no matter what's gone on in the past, I can redesign my life. And so at age 24, I redesigned my life such that I lost more than 100 pounds over the course of a year, and I got out of the troubled relationship, and I found my life's work, and all of these amazing things happened out of that one moment of creative openness, of opening up this creative space that I never realized I had. And so my life ever since then, in one way or the other, this was long before I wrote The Big Leap or we were on Oprah or anything like that, way before there, my life was about helping other people find that space in themselves, the place from which you can redesign your life according to your own standards and specs and how you want it to be. So most of us um, know that we have a blessed life in many ways, but we don't realize that we could really go all the way and have our dreams come true. And by that, I mean, do what you are here to do. Do what down inside you is that, what I call your genius, to bring that forth, I think is the sacred task of human beings. And we're not happy unless we're doing that. So uh, I've been in the exalted business the past 40 or 50 years of living that every day and helping other people open up more space for that in themselves. And so uh, the new book, The Genius Zone, is really about if the big leap showed you how to jump into this genius zone, the genius zone, <laughs> The genius zone shows you how to live there all the time, how to how to make your home there. And I think it's really the only satisfying true home. Even if you live in a dream house like I do, it wouldn't be home unless I was in my genius too. I, can I just say that the amount of energy, like you are beaming right now. For those of us, you who are listening, you could go find it on, on the YouTube channel. You'll see exactly what I mean. The level of energy, like the beams coming out of you as you're talking, I, I can tell that you live <laughs> in your zone of genius. And this is how we should live, which I think is why your work resonates with so many people. So you mentioned you've written several books um, and including The Big Leap, which a lot of our audience does know about. And you coined the term upper limit problem. Yes. So for those who may not know, let's give some context, right? What is an upper limit problem and how do you overcome it? Yes. One of the great scientific observation moments of my life was about 30 or 35 years ago, long before. When people tell me, ask me how long it took me to write The Big Leap, I say, I thought about it for 30 years and then it only took me a year to write it. But for 30 years, I'd been thinking about this problem I started calling it the upper limit problem because what it is, is that when things start to go better, it awakens fears in us that may, we may not have paid attention to. But when life starts to flow better, oftentimes it awakens those fears and then we find a way to self-sabotage by creating what I call an upper limit problem where we get sick or we have an accident or we create an argument or we find some way to mess up that, that knocks us back down to where we were before. So one of the great tasks of life is to accustom yourself to better and better things going on for longer and longer periods of time. When I got together with Katie 40 years ago, we realized, we started catching on to this upper limit problem in relationships. And we noticed that we would get along well for a few days. And then one of us would do something. We start an argument or 
pick on the other person critically, and it would stop that flow of positive energy. And then we'd have to kind of get it back again. And after a while, we begin to say, wait, what is this pattern? Are we kind of allergic to that flow of love? And in a way, you can think of an upper limit problem, <laughs> almost like an allergy, you know, that you get to a certain place and you hachoo, and uh, it knocks you out of the space you were in. And so uh, think of the upper limit kind of like a glass seat, uh, kind of like an invisible ceiling that you keep bumping up against when you try to grow a little more, or an invisible wall that you keep uh, bumping up against. Um, I don't know if you ever saw that study many years ago. Um, I can't even remember now. It was so long ago, but somebody did an experiment where they put a little plexiglass shield, an invisible shield, between two sides of an aquarium where both sides had fish in it. And so after a while, the fish bumped up against that thing so much that they just took the plexiglass out and they never crossed over into the other side of the aquarium again, even though the, it was the same water, there was no shield there anymore. And in right. a way, that's how the upper limit problem works, because even though the original barrier may be there, maybe you got spanked for doing something when you were three years old, you were playing with your favorite thing and you didn't come when people called and so somebody gave you a swat or yelled at you those kind of moments put a little crimp in our ability to access and feel the flow of our organic creative genius. And I'm here to tell you, I have worked with, I've been 32 times around the world now, if you count up all the miles, and in every culture I've ever worked in, everybody has this same version or their version of the upper limit problem. Down in Australia, they call it the tall poppy syndrome. Oh, tall Don't poppy be, syndrome. I've heard of that. Yes. Don't be the tall poppy because if you stick out above, the farmer will cut its head off. And that's the, that's the thing that's said every time. They'll always, if you can't see me, I'm going to draw a, a line across my throat, like cutting my throat. That's the, when you ask an all Australian, what's the tall poppy syndrome? They'll go, yep like that, you know, and uh, that's ingrained in that culture. Uh, I can't remember the name for it up in, um, up in Northern Thailand, but they had their own version of it. Uh, some name I can no longer pronounce, but every culture has some version of that attempt to kind of limit ourselves. Um, so I think it's one of our duties almost as a human being, if we're an awakening human being, to put a real careful study on that upper limit problem and how we do it to ourselves. So the big leap shows you that underneath the upper limit problem is a whole bunch of fears, you know, a handful of fears, the fear of outshining other people. So when you start to shine a little bit in the outer world, you find some way to mess it up because unconsciously you're afraid that you're stealing light and love from other people. Another one is, I've worked with even Oscar winners and Grammy winners who have this, which is that the more famous they get, the more it drags up a fundamental feeling of unworthiness. So it comes to a head just before they're about to get the Grammy award, or it comes to a head. In one case, I worked with a guy just before he was going to get his palm prints in the cement down on um, Sunset or Hollywood Boulevard or wherever that thing is. I'm, I Somewhere in LA. <laughs> Somewhere down in LA, wherever you put your paw prints. Uh, but anyway, the day before he was going to have that happen, whoosh, major anxiety, crippling anxiety. It brought up that feeling of I'm unworthy and I've never dealt with that deep old un feeling of unworthiness. So it can happen to the biggest office and you know, I started out my career working with uh, juvenile delinquents and incarcerated kids, and it was exactly the same inside them, too. So they would have three good days, 
and then they would mess it up. And so I started calling that the upper limit problem. And I'm so glad it's caught on, you know, if I look out on Twitter on a given day and I'll see that the hashtag upper limits problem has, you know, 68 dozen people discussing it. And that pleases me a lot because once people are beginning to think about life that way, they realize that life can really be about a continuous upward expansion of love, abundance and creativity. It doesn't have to have hiccups in it. Along if you the way. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I put out something on Instagram a while back uh, called, uh, you know, what's your deal with the universe? And I was talking about my deal with the universe is I want to expand every day in love, abundance and creative energy while I inspire other people to do the same thing. That's what I asked for originally in my life purpose, you know, 30, 40 years ago. Um, I was inspired by Buckminster Fuller when he was 27. He kind of bottomed out and went into a deep depression and didn't think he was going to make it on this planet and everything he'd done failed. And he one day in a moment of desperation made a new deal with the universe. He said, OK, I'm going to use all of my design skills to create advantages for other people. And in return for dedicating my life to that, I want to be supported in some fashion where I don't have to think about money all the time. And, you know, whoosh. I think he filed his last patent when he was 85 years old or 83 years old, something like that. So he was busily, ever since that moment, he was a living embodiment of creative expansion. And I, that's the way I wanted to live my life, too. And I've been very blessed to be able to do that. When I first started, I was spending about 10% of my time in my genius zone. And mm. so I just set little incremental expansions, which I invite you and in, in your community to do to set, you know, you don't need to rent a canoe and paddle to Tibet or the, you know, to a desert island to meditate. All we ask is that you begin to do 10 minutes more a day of doing what you most love to do. Find out what you most love to do and increase it by 10 minutes. Then you're gonna to wanna to do it 20 minutes. That's how I did it. I went from 10% of my time in my genius zone around 1990 to close to 100% by the end of the century, which is where I still am now, 21 years later. I say close to because, you know, like yesterday I was bringing in the recycling bins and that's one of my jobs around here. I'm not a genius at it. It's not in my genius zone, right. but it's something I you know, do. Life. You know, yeah, it's just life. <laughs> Practical you know? and, things we need to do in life. <laughs> <laughs> but most of the time, if I'm awake, I'm doing some version of what you and I are doing right now, uh, which I will do gladfully, you know, whether it's on Oprah or your show or wherever I can do it, because uh, the payoff for me is so immense because once you understand that you're where creative energy comes from and you make your commitment to bringing that forth more every day, wow, the miracles just kind of fall all over themselves happening. Yeah, it's interesting that you say that because I'm at a stage in my business now where I only just recently, I feel like started coming into the genius zone. Uh, but similar to what you said, you know, there were a lot of practical things that needed to get put in place first so that I could do that and building that stuff out was not fun and killed my creativity, we will get there because <laughs> I've got a good story for you. Speaking of good stories, I have another good story for you. Right. So thanks thanks to your book, um, The Big Leap, I can recognize upper limit problems when they're happening. So a couple months, we had like one of our best revenue months in the business ever and all of my technology broke down and I had to go replace everything. <laughs> So, but the good news is I'm able to recognize it and laugh at it now, but this brings me to my question because we talk a lot about finance on this podcast. What does it mean when you keep, you know, manifesting, I guess, for lack of a better term, like financial issues, like you start getting some money and then suddenly like he, the, the upper limit is like, oh, here comes the money out the door again. Here comes some emergency or some unexpected expense. Yes. Well, once you dedicate yourself to creating more abundance in your life, think of it as a baby first learning to breathe. You know, there's some 
fits and starts to it until the flow gets in there. So expect some fits and starts until you get that ah, inflow of positive energy with the in-breath and the full outflow with the out-breath. So life to me works best when I'm fully receiving and fully giving, when I'm in a flow of that. And here's something for your listeners and viewers to contemplate. I have noticed since we started going out and doing big shows, um, you know, 30, 40 years ago, that a lot of people that would be in the audience of Oprah or a lot of the people that listen to your podcast or watch your YouTube channel are often people who are imbalanced in the giving direction. They're good at giving, they're good at contributing, but they're not, they haven't polished up their skill of receiving enough. As a matter of fact, um, that's one of the big reasons I wrote the new book, The Genius Zone, is because once you find you're in that space I'm talking about, and I show you very specifically how to get into it in the book, you just got to sit down for an hour and do it. You know, it's just all laid out for you there. But once you do it and open up that space, you realize that your big task is to, in the largest sense, open up to receiving more all the time. I found that once you get that balance going of giving and receiving, it is a delicious space because what happens, a lot of times people in our field, people that are into helping others and to, you know, teaching and counseling and things like that, and in running enlightened businesses, those kinds of things, people like us have certain tendencies. We tend to do a lot of things that are not in our genius zone and get yep. tired so that we don't have time to spend in our genius zone. <clears throat> Big problem. Yep. Okay. I bet you've seen that. I bet lots of people I listening have. have seen that. I've yeah. probably lived it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I have too, more than once, believe me, because I come from the same place as everybody else with this. I was a baby learning to breathe the first time I had this insight. You know, the first time I realized, oh, I was feeling good. Then I started worrying about my daughter. Now I don't feel good. Hmm. Why would I have started worrying about my daughter? You know, and it wasn't because there was anything wrong with my daughter. It was just because I had an old program that said I didn't entitle, I wasn't entitled to feeling good for very long without invoking some kind of worry thought about something that might be wrong somewhere. Right. I had learned that pattern. And so most of us come almost from the factory with that pattern installed. If you grew up in a family, pretty much you have a program installed, which is don't feel that. And right. so we impose that on ourselves. And one of that don't feel that is your creative energy. Like uh, one of my colleagues who's now passed on, John Bradshaw, he wrote a number of big books back in the 80s and 90s, one called Homecoming. And one called Healing the Shame That Binds You. And he talks about when he was four years old, he runs into the living room one night. He's learned to name the parts. And he says, these are my eyes. And his family goes, yay. And he says, here's my mouth. And the family goes, yay. And he points down toward his penis. And he starts mm -hmm. to say, here's my, and the family goes, whoa, whoa, whoa. you know, and so learning the, learning to celebrate all of our, different sensations and emotions and body parts and elements of ourselves. That's one of the great tasks of life, learning how to own those parts and be with those parts and to feel good about our sexuality or to feel good about our fear, our anger, our sadness, our joy, to open up that space around our feeling. You see, I think happiness has more to do with the space we give around our feelings than it is a specific feeling itself. So I would like to have us have enough space around our anger, for example, that you can actually feel okay about being angry, not have it take your life away with you. Right. Or I want to be with my sadness in such a way that I can be with it fully and know that it hasn't disturbed the essential element of me, that pure consciousness part of me that's always holding everything. One of my favorite uh, quotations from uh, our great American poet, 
Walt Whitman is, I am large and contain multitudes. And I think that all of us need to feel the space, the magnificence of ourselves and all of the elements that Walt Whitman is with, you know, the multitudes of our feelings and the multitude of our creative activities down our there, human experience right i yes. was literally just journaling about this this morning i'm like it's okay to be human it's okay to be human and it's okay to feel all the things of the human experience but, but there's so much resistance around it to your point that it, it kind of spirals a little bit <laughs> you, you're going control. to tell me a story Oh yeah, I'm getting there, right? Like, cause it's about the new book, The Genius Zone, which came in um, at the perfect time because in the book you talk about getting in the genius zone and living in that space of creativity. And as I was mentioning, you know, if the big leap is, is like the prequel to this book right now, that makes complete sense in my mind now, because, you know, with the technology breaking down and we're having the best revenue months ever, okay, definitely an upper limit problem. But then here was the other problem, which is when your new book came into my life, very, you know, synchronistically, <laughs> right, which was, um, you know, I spent two and a half years really grinding and building out infrastructure and systems. And, you know, 2020 was also a nightmare for like most of the world. And I finally finished building all the infrastructure and the systems. And it was like the creative space that I once had, it felt like it died. Like it went mm -hmm. dormant, right? And when I was going through your book, which I read the whole thing in almost one sitting, by the way, I was like, oh, this makes complete sense. And, and now with what we're talking, you know, it's because I wasn't in my zone of genius for two and a half years. You know, I had to do what I had to do in order to get to my zone of genius. But then when I was done doing what I had to do, it, I mean, it took a good, like, maybe a couple of months for me to feel like, oh, okay, I'm like, allowed to be on podcasts with legends. I'm allowed to make this amount of money without having to grind. I'm allowed to have a really great team. And then the ideas started coming back again, right? Like, oh, try yeah. this, try that, right? But it was a really interesting process for me because it literally felt like it just went dormant and I had really no explanation for it. And now I have the explanation, <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> so um, you've, you've talked about it a little bit. Um, you know, so in the new book, right, you talk a lot about creativity, actually. And one of the distinctions that you make is ordinary creativity versus true creativity. What is the difference? Ordinary creativity is when you're using your creativity, but you're using it for somebody else, basically. You know, you're, you're maybe in a job, you may be in a great job. And you realize, uh, like I um, have a, a client who's a, a big designer, designs um, things, <laughs> different kinds of things. But uh, anyway, that's not that's the key point. But her business is design. And so um, she was working for another big firm where she was using her genius but she was having to use it in certain pigeonholed ways. <laughs> like, uh, for example, imagine Picasso having to have a day job as a greeting card designer. Okay, there would be frustrations in that for Picasso uh, because their whole thing had to be put down into a size of a greeting card that had to have a snappy message on it. Well, that was kind of the position she was in. And so the solution was twofold there. Once the first position or first thing she had to do was get so what she was doing now wasn't causing stress because she'd be sitting there doing one thing and being kind of irritated because she wasn't getting to do what she really wanted to do. And so we did work on two things. One was expansion of her genius within her current job, which took a couple of months to do because she needed to go to her boss and say, hey, look, there's this other thing. I want to put some energy into it. Can I start doing that? Would that be OK? And so that took her a month or two to kind of right. craft the pitch. And uh, and he said, sure, you know, it's a 10 second pitch, basically. And uh, so she was able to start. Let's say she was putting 10 percent of her genius. So she was able to build 20 percent maybe into her current job. 
But then what I wanted her to do was make sure even with that day job, she was doing 10 minutes a day of pure genius on her own. That's her investment in the future. And if you're not willing to invest 10 minutes a day in your future, you know, it's hard to imagine how you can create a future. But if you will uh, take 10 minutes and put it in your calendar for the first month or so, and then you're going to want to do 20 minutes, and then you put that in your calendar. But I want you to put 10 minutes a day in your calendar where you do nothing but focus on your pure creative genius for you. And that's the difference between ordinary creativity and true creativity. True creativity serves you at the same time as it contributes to other people. Oh, that was so other, good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you. Yeah. And so true creativity comes when you're doing what you most love to do in a way that makes the biggest contribution to people around you, to your community, to the world. I write books, so I get to do things that get appreciated in a large way. But your genius might be in making a soup that only gets appreciated by a bunch of people at a homeless shelter, or you might be making a, a soup that's only appreciated by a small family. But if it's got your genius in it, that's going to make a difference out there in the world because genius can be tasted, genius can be seen, genius can be appreciated. And if you will bring forth more of that, even in little moments of 10 minutes a day, I promise you, you'll never regret it because I've been doing this for a long time now and I've never had a person come back to me yet out of, I think we've worked with coming in on something like uh, 25,000 people now live and in person. I've never had a person yet come back and say, doggone it, Gay, all that time you had me finished focusing on my genius, that was a pure waste. You know, what I get all the time is I live on a steady diet of email that says, thank you for giving me my life back. You know, now yeah, I'm I can doing imagine. stuff that I love to do. That's one of the most delicious things about writing transformational books is the quality of mail and email you get. Well, and the lives you've touched. So I imagine someone in the audience is probably overthinking this right now. So I'm channeling them with the question I'm about to ask, right? Which is, um, what if someone doesn't know what their genius is? I imagine, I, I don't know who this is for. Someone's listening to this. I can feel it like I can feel it in the future, but <laughs> someone's going to be kind of like, um, okay, that's great. But like, I don't know if this is my genius or if that's my genius, or maybe yeah. my genius is over here, or maybe it's over there. And then they're just dry, putting themselves into a tizzy over it. So what would you say to that person? Well, let me give you a $20,000 gift of an answer here. One of the, the, sometimes corporations pay us a chunk of money to have their CEO come here and we work with them, kind of have a monster big leap day, you know, and uh, it, it costs $20,000 to the corporation. And let me tell you the very first thing we do with them. We ask the person to go in a little room by themselves. It just has a chair in it. There's nothing on the wall, not even a clock. And um, we invite them to repeat the following wonder question over and over in their mind and breathe. We ask them to repeat the question in their mind and just breathe, focus on their breathing for 10 minutes and we'll come back and get you in 10 minutes. And so what they're doing is asking themselves the following question. Hmm, what do I most love to do? And then three easy breaths. One, two, easy breath. Three easy breaths. So that takes 20 seconds or so to take 20, 30 seconds to take three easy breaths. And then you say the question again, hmm, what do I most love to do? I'll tell you something. <laughs> people come out after 10 minutes and some people say, <laughs> some people say that was the longest 10 minutes of my life. And because uh, they're not used to meditating or anything like that. But uh, what the, what they usually say is, why didn't I do that 30 years ago? Why didn't right. somebody have me do that in college or high school? Right. You know, Because if you look back 
through your whole life, look back to when you were a kid, there were probably things that you loved to do when you were a kid that have the same flavor to them as your genius now. Mm. Uh, I can't remember if it was in the Big Leap where I tell the story about my uh, uh, the day I got my tricycle when I was, uh, I think I was four years old. It sounds um, familiar, so it might be yeah, the Big Leap, yeah. Um, well, I'll give you a quick version of it here. Um, when I was, uh, oh, the day I got my new tricycle, I had my heart set on getting a new tricycle and it happened the day of my birthday, but it was pouring rain as it often does in January in Florida. It's a very wet month in Florida frequently. And so uh, it continued to pour all day long. And so I was kind of, finally I begged my grandmother, um, can I ride it inside? Normally something like that would be strictly forbidden, but because of the uniqueness of the situation, my grandmother let me ride my tricycle around her living room as much as I wanted that day. And um, very grateful to her for that. But what I did during that day was I got my granddad to bring in a cardboard box and put it in the corner of the room. And to, I told him what to write on the box. And what I had written on the box, I had my granddad write it, <clears throat> was problems. And I sat in my box, I would commute on my tricycle and I would get into my box and I would sit there in the cardboard box and I would entertain people that came to talk to me about their problems. Like Lucy now, from Peanuts. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But this is long before Peanuts. Yeah. You know? And this was That's what I just envisioned in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Peanuts hadn't even been invented yet. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, the funny thing was, I lived in a town of 10,000 people where there was by the, even when I was in high school, there was no psychiatrist or psychologist or, you know, there was a dozen churches with ministers, but I, I, I told people, and this has become a family joke that even to this day, if I go visit family members, they'll kid me about this, about, I told them that I didn't handle medical problems. Uh, I told them that any, a regular doctor could deal with that, but I handled other kind of problems and I couldn't quite explain to them what my specialty was, but uh, but anyway, they all thought it was hilarious. And so uh, somewhere out there in the annals of the Hendricks family is a picture of me sitting in my cardboard box waiting for my patients to arrive. For your there, patients for to your... line up and arrive. That is amazing. <laughs> um, I hear that a lot. And actually I heard someone say recently, I would love your take on this actually, now that we're here and we're having this discussion, I heard someone say recently, you know, usually the things you got in trouble for in school are the things that make you a lot of money later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that's funny you should say that because a couple of things in my life, uh, my brother and I, I grew up with my older brother, he's eight years older, and I was sort of a uh, last minute uh, addition to the family. Um, and uh, so, but my brother has a wild sense of humor. And so early on, I learned to banter with my brother and be real quick with my repartee, which got me in a lot of trouble in uh, high school. As a matter of fact, got me uh, bounced once for uh, being a smart uh a smart uh, ass with my uh, high school biology teacher who had a short temper. Uh, but anyway, um, yeah, but to this day, like my wife said she fell in love with me when I opened my mouth because she thought I was the funniest person she had ever seen in her life. And uh, because of some things I just said in the first minute or so that I knew her. And so to me, having a sense of humor has brought me 40 plus years of a relationship with a woman where I wake up every day of my life feeling like the luckiest person on earth because I Aww. get to be married to Katie. And I think humor has a lot to do with, I mean, it has a lot to do with what I she mean, recognized in me. Women do like funny guys. We do like funny men. We like it when a guy can make us laugh. So that's probably it right there. <laughs> And I'll tell you, there's no sweeter sound to my ears than the sound of her laughing, Katie la laughing at something funny I've said, or just her laughter in general, you know, watching a TV show or something. It's a, I can see it's why a, you've lasted 40 years <laughs> in marriage. <laughs> her laughter is like Mozart. Oh, okay. So 
Actually, this is a great segue into the next um, subject, which is commitment, since you've been committed to Katie for four years. What a great segue, right? Um, I like the way you talk about it in the book because you you talk about it from different angles. Um, and you mentioned two things that really struck out to me. So number one, you need to commit to something, right? But number two, it's not just the committing to something once, it's the recommitment when you fall off the commitment. So can you give our listeners um, an overview of why commitment matters and maybe that different perspective of looking at it? Because I do feel like people tend to rake themselves over the coals a lot when they don't I don't know, like I know for me, for example, I'll I'll set certain targets or certain goals where I'm trying to do something. And then, you know, I'm human. I let that human, that's probably why I was journaling this morning. It's okay to be human, (laughs) (laughs) right? Because I'll have a human experience or life happens or whatever. And then I feel like, um, but then I'm able to sort of come back and recommit to it as soon as I can. But I feel like so many people get stuck in the, I committed once, I couldn't keep to it. I'm never going to be able to make this happen. So can you speak to that? Yes, I appreciate you bringing up this um, point too, because it's something that's not well understood, that recommitment is as important as commitment. Um, If you think about um, commitment, um, you know, like um, you're for a child of yours, or, or, you know, you're really committed to that person, and that person makes a mistake. And then, you know, then it disturbs the relationship, then you have to choose again, that level of intimacy, or there's some kind of betrayal in your relationship, and it throws you off, and then you have to recommit to that. And so, going into commitment, it's one thing to say, I commit to you. Let's say you're having a relationship, you're getting married or something like that, or committing to a new job. It's one thing to say, I commit to it, but then we're all going to wander off of those commitments and need to recommit and bring ourselves back home. And so that's one thing I want everybody to know is that in a way, falling off the wagon is as natural and organic as getting on the wagon in the first place. And it's an important part of the process. Um, When my daughter was first learning to ride horseback, I took her to her horse lessons. And I happen to, I don't like horses personally. I don't like the way they smell and they kind of frighten me a little (laughs) bit. I've never had a congenial relationship with Horses, which is probably why my daughter fell hell, or fed, <laughs> fell head over heels in love with horses when she was a kid. And I spent about... She was rebelling. She was rebelling. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she just loved horses. And so I took her to the, uh, to the stables all the time. And there was about a four-year period there where my poor VW bus, I could never get the horse smells out of it. But anyway, that's my own karma to deal with. But uh, the point I'm making is the first time I took her to her first riding lesson, the trainer, who was this lovely lady who was very experienced, got Amanda up on the horse. Amanda, that's my daughter's name, by the way. Um, and um, I, I, so she got Amanda up on the horse and Amanda got kind of situated. And I can't even remember how old she was. I'm, I'm thinking she wasn't even in, in uh, first grade yet. Maybe she was still in kindergarten. I remember she was a, not big, but she just had to ride a horse. That was the one thing she wanted for her birthday. So we went and did this. And so she started trotting along or walking along with the woman kind of trotting along beside her. And then after about maybe 30 feet, she was kind of getting the hang of it and then clunk and fell off. And the woman kind of half caught her and, but she slid on down to the ground and the woman just checked and quickly to make sure she was okay. And then just went whoosh and put her back on the horse and they were trotting again. And Amanda, it just took a second for Amanda to get reoriented again. And it happened again another time and another time. And each time I would freak out, you know, ah, you know, because my daughter had just fallen off this horse that looked about 28 feet tall from where I was sitting, you know. And so, um, but the point I'm making, it was the recommitment, getting back on the horse where she actually developed facility doing it. And she literally got back on the saddle. Yeah, she literally got back on the saddle. 
And I've had that experience. I was a late comer to skiing, for example. I grew up in Florida, so <laughs> there was nothing. Yeah, to, we don't do uh, skiing in Florida. It's very flat and there's no snow, <laughs> in case nobody knows. <laughs> <laughs> Not a whole uh, lot of skiing going on here. Not snow skiing. We will have water skiing <laughs> or jet skiing. No, I, didn't, I didn't lay eyes on a flake of snow until I was 23 years old, believe it or not. And oh, I, I even... think I was, yeah, actually, I think I was around the same age. I, no, no, it didn't snow that time. Actually, I think I was almost 30. Did, did you grow up in Miami? I grew up in Miami. I don't, I don't you... do well in cold. It just, it's uh -huh. not a thing for me. Did you go to Edison or where did you go? Uh, for college, you mean? No, did you go to like Coral Gables High or where did you go for Oh yeah, school? Coral Gables High was my high school, yeah. Well, a good friend of mine, Arielle Ford, uh, you'll probably have her on your podcast someday. She uh, writes books, uh, she writes relationship books. Uh, she was a grad of Coral Gables High. No way, yeah, yep. I was a class of 2006. I actually just drove by it the other day on Memorial Day weekend. I was like, oh look, there's Coral Gables High. I'd love to have Ariel Ford if you could make that happen. We could, you know, talk about being Cavaliers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, she's a dear. Uh, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll connect you up. We text back and forth all the time. Um, yeah, what, what was I in the middle of? Uh, what were you in the middle oh, of? Oh, we were talking, talking about? about how we don't ski in Florida. <laughs> oh, 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 yeah. <laughs> yes, big and fact. connecting uh, it back to commitment. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I had the same problem with skiing because I didn't learn to ski until I was, oh, how old was I? I was way up into my 20s, maybe even my late 20s, early 30s, actually. Uh, but it was not a natural subject for me. And I remember falling down. You know, and actually falling down so many times my first ski days that I got hopeless about it, got to that despair place where I'm never going to get that. And fortunately, I was living in Colorado. I'd moved to Colorado to become a professor there at the University of Colorado in the counseling psych department in the year of 1974. So I said, I love this place. I want to be here. So I better learn to get really happy with snow. So I kept myself focusing on skiing and I got to be a pretty good rudimentary skier, you know, I can handle a, a medium ski run. But uh, the, the point I'm making is it's commitment and it's recommitment. But then let me introduce a real big subject that goes along with this, which is unconscious commitment. Ooh, because I'm intrigued. If you, yeah, if you have something you want and have made a goal about Let's say you make the goal of, I want to have my business make a million dollars this year. So that's my goal. Um, well, what happens oftentimes if you fall short or miss that goal or wander off onto some other goal, it's because there is an older unconscious commitment that has power over your conscious one. And the way you have, <laughs> we have infrastructure repair here today. So your uh, editor may have to uh, tweak that a little bit. Um, you're good. I've been waiting for my cat to start wailing. So you're fine. <laughs> <laughs> I've noticed your cat very, uh, very uh, quietly coming in and out of the picture there. Uh, yeah, I think I, we... she's telepathic. I sent her a tell, like I'm pretty, like I'm convinced this cat is telepathic. And I sent her a message. I was like, please don't start wailing right now. And she's listening. So. <laughs> Uh, well, I, I have to pause in the middle of whatever story I was telling to tell you, I resonated so much a while back when you talked about your infrastructure, your technology falling apart, because Katie and I, <laughs> this is so perfect. We had one of the greatest years in the life of, we've been doing what we do since 1989, we've had our own institute. And this past year, even though it was a pandemic year, it put us up against guilt sometimes because we had one of the most amazing years we've ever had. Yeah. Book sales like the big leap, which has been out that for guilt is real. 10 or 11 years. Yeah. Whoop, you know, suddenly it's selling triple what it normally sells. So we're getting yeah. these huge royalty checks and, and our business, we took everything onto Zoom. So instead of 50 people having to fly and get into a little town in Ojai, California, you know, to do the training, uh, now, Instead of those 50, we've got 
550 scattered around the world taking the same training in Dubai and wherever they are, you know, and that's very exciting to me. Um, so in a way, the pandemic was an incredible, ironic gift. Um, but uh, yeah, and you sounds like you felt some of those same or you've heard some of those same uh, Oh, issues. no, I felt it. Like when things started really coming down, um, well, my first business, I was a financial writer. I felt guilty because I knew what to do. I felt guilty because I was sitting on the precipice of something major. We do marketing and sales training. Um, I was like, oh, my God, I'm going to end up making more money on the other end of this, right? Because what's going to happen? Everybody's going to freak out because they don't know how to sell in a time of emergency. And that's exactly what happened. People were knocking down my door and that guilt actually did get to me. And um, is that an upper limit guilt? That's an upper limit problem. <laughs> it's of an course. upper limit. Yeah. Yeah. I was raised Catholic. I know all about guilt. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. you got a PhD in guilt. <laughs> I got a PhD in guilt, but yeah, that actually happened to me too. I was like, wow, we have the potential to walk out of this, like in better position than ever before. And I think I shut down a little bit in the beginning because of it, because that guilt started taking over. Yeah, we had the same kind of thing come up and uh, realized it was an upper limit problem right away though, as most worry is, by the way. Yeah. Uh, if you're within the range of my voice right now, know that 99.999% of the things that you worry about have absolutely nothing to do with anything except your mind not being able to relax into serenity. Uh, that our minds just busily keeping uh, pumping out worry thoughts about things we have absolutely no control over just as a matter of habit. So one of the best things you can do is put a focus on your thinking. And um, part of the, uh, the new book, The Genius Zone, is about how to unhook your negative thinking. So yes, that you, you can... read you read my mind. That was the next question. <laughs> yes, well. Perfect see, segue. Which yeah, is... I, Maybe someday I'll come back on here. I want to talk about unconscious commitment a little bit uh, too, because I started to mention that. But when you ever, if you ever have a goal that in it isn't manifesting, look underneath it and say, do I have an unconscious commitment to not having that goal? Like for example, if you've messed up three or four relationships in a row or had them not work out, ask yourself, do I have an unconscious commitment to proving that I'm unlovable. A lot of us have an unconscious commitment in our relationships to proving our unlovableness by, by hiring a partner that criticizes us or hiring a partner right. that isn't there I see for it with us money creative. all the time. People have unconscious commitments to being broke. Oh, really? Yes, all I, the time. I had one of those myself. In fact, I can remember the actual moment where Katie and I turned around our poverty script and became on our way to being um, prosperous was one moment where I caught myself in a moment of negative thinking way back, first year of our relationship. I was thinking, do we have enough money to get through to the end of the month? And then I realized, wait a minute, that's exactly the same conversation I always heard growing up. Mm -hmm. And here I am reproducing the same situation in my life. Could it be that the way I'm thinking about my money consciousness is the problem? You know, is it that that in itself has a flaw in it? Well, suddenly I realized that, oh my God, we could retire that program and install a new program of our own design. I mean, that's one of the great things about the human brain, of right? Of course, and we're the only thing in nature that is able to do that, right? That's yeah. that's our power and that's our choice. And a lot of times we're just not using it appropriately because we haven't been taught how to use it appropriately. So this is a great segue. You went into it, right? Because in the book, you do mention that you help, you're going to help the reader remove negative thinking forever. Now, we might have people listening who are like, uh-huh, yeah, right, sure, whatever, <laughs> <laughs> right. So without giving the whole book away, people go buy the book, right? Without giving the whole book away, how do they do that? Yes. Well, I hope you will get the book and sit down for an hour with it. You can master the fundamentals of what it has to say in an hour. I hope you'll come back and do that hour a few more times, but give yourself a solid hour of the book. But let me give you the opening kind of punchline of the book up, up front. 
a lot of the things that pass through your mind, a lot of the negative thinking that passes through your mind, just like mine and just like Amanda's, everybody's wired the same way. Much of the negative thinking that goes through your mind is about things that you have no control over, things that you could not possibly change in any way because they have to do with how other people feel or how other people think, or particularly they have to do with the past. So many of us crank out thousands of thoughts a day about the past over which we have absolutely no control. Other people crank out or with anxiety, folks crank out thousands of thoughts about the future, many negative thoughts about the future. But one thing about the future is we have absolutely no control over it. And so, the art of living in a way comes from opening up and realizing that a lot of your energy has been spent in your mind and your body and your life trying to control things that you have absolutely no control over. And as you open that up and relax the grip of that control, which was trying to control things you can't control anyway, but when, yep. you, when you release that grip on that imaginary whatever that thing is, it opens up a space of creative, positive energy that takes you into places that you can't predict. You know, like I couldn't predict the magnificence of my life now when I first started because I didn't have any way even to think about no this context. Kind of life. No, no context. No context for it. Yeah. So you just got to take it one day at a time, 10 minutes at a time opening up a little bit more to your genius every day and learning how to live in your genius. You know, the big leap was about how to kind of leap into your genius. And the genius zone is a lot about how to adjust your wings so that you can fly in that zone in a way that's really effortless. I'm telling that is the perfect metaphor, adjust your wings, because I feel that is a transition I have been through. And then here comes an email from your team <laughs> about your new book. And then I read the book literally in one sitting and I'm like, oh my God, this is literally what I've been going through. And I don't believe in accidents. I think everything is divinely ordered and we all have, you know, divine purposes and divine gifts and, and divine things that we're meant to do in this life. So um, I know that's basically your specialty is helping people bring those things out into the world. So let the people know what you've got going on. What, what is going on with the Institute? What events do you have going on? Let the people know. All right, great. Well, one thing to know is uh, if you'd like to get the book, one good place to do it is geniuszonebook.com. It has its own special website because there, if you buy it through, uh, you know, there's all the Amazon and uh, mm -hmm. Books a Million and there's various places to buy the book. But the cool thing is you also, if you buy the book through that page, you get a free auditory download of a 15 minute guided meditation where I take you through five key affirmations that are very useful in living in the genius zone. And so you, you get to hear it in my own voice and I'll take you through and you can do it over and over again, um, the 15 minutes. Uh, but it's um, something that I urge everybody to do because it's good to learn through reading a book, but also to hear it through your ears and my voice, I think will help you in other ways. And so if you buy the book through geniuszonebook.com, you get the opportunity to download that. Uh, so tell your friends about that opportunity. Our institute, yeah, we do um, lots of trainings every year. One is in relationship work, our conscious relationship work that you'll see in our book, Conscious Loving and other books like that that we've written. Uh, a second training is our one on body intelligence and learning to use the wisdom of the body where we teach our breath work, we teach our movement work, we teach you how to be in your body in a way that uh, enables you to feel much less stress and a much more uh, joyful flow of ease in your body all the time. And um, our main work, of course, is training coaches and how to do that. Um, and we have, uh, I think, um, gosh, several hundred of them around the world now, and we train more every year. So um, go to Hendrix.com if you'd like to find out about all those kinds of things. My wife, Katie, runs the uh, training institute aspect of ourselves. 
and I'm over in the corner in a small darkened room with my computer writing the books. And uh, <laughs> they, they let me out in public now and then to do one of well, these you Well, the two of you make a fabulous team. Thank <laughs> you so much for being here. Thank you. I, I feel like you're like a wisdom keeper, like a wisdom keeper and a wisdom sharer. I don't know if she, but I feel like you've just poured into me in the last hour. So thank you so much. And not just for this interview, but literally everything you and Katie have done over the course of your careers, you've touched millions of lives and I'm honored to have you on here to help you touch more. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for doing the work you do for tapping into your own genius, Amanda, and uh, taking your work out in the world in a way that really makes a contribution to other people's lives. Oh, I just got chills. I just got chills. All right, everybody, until next week, cheers to making money your honey.